Well, um, let, me, let me say this. The question is, what is the relevance of the law to us today? And I was sharing some thoughts about this at lunch. Um, to me, it's important to see what purposes the Bible says about the law, uh, that the law, the reason the law was given. First of all, when we go back, uh, you know, I, I won't take time to go through all of these passages because I know most of you have read them. Um, if we go back to Exodus, if we go back to Deuteronomy, the law was given to Israel. It was given to Israel uh, and the covenants within the law, the precepts within the law was given to Israel to do many things. It was to guide them as a nation. Um, it was, we, we need to remember that Israel was not just a spiritual covenant community and I'm not denying that there is a spiritual covenant aspect to Israel but the law that God gave to Israel was also a nationalistic law it was a law that governed them as a physical nation day in and day out as they were to live it was given to Israel and tenants within the within the within the covenants and within the law such as the Passover all of those things to remember their deliverance out of the bondage of Egypt there is no more relevant concept in the law to new covenant redemption than the day of atonement or the concept of atonement and I agree wholeheartedly with what Ward said about the Sabbath every nuance and every aspect of Sabbath and it's far more than just the sixth day observance it is uh, the Jubilee system it is the cycles of Sabbath uh, all of those things uh, have one uh, particular design and that is to show a time when God through his covenant work would make man and bring man to a point back to a point of complete dependence if you think through all of the Sabbath customs and laws everything about Sabbath had to do with man resting allowing God to provide and so what we find in Christ is the ultimate reality of all of that Sabbath and we are in Christ every day in the Sabbath rest that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 66 with the coming of the new heavens and the new earth so we have all of those passages that teach what this who this law was given to and why in Romans chapter 3 the whole epistle of uh, Romans and, and by the way I'm 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 anxiously waiting uh, uh, Max King has been writing a book on Romans 9 through 11 which really is more of a commentary on all of Romans and I'm longing for the time when that comes out I think it's going to be uh, earth-shattering and groundbreaking for a lot of uh, reasons from a lot of people for a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds but here's what I hang my hat on it, it's clear as Paul goes through in Romans that righteousness was never intended by God to be achieved through the observance of the law never was it achieved in fact God had a very specific intent for the law that was diametrically opposed to that Paul's wrestling with the law is later on when Paul says I now realize that the very commandment Romans 7 that I thought would bring life brought death and it's that body of death that Paul wants delivered from when, in Romans 7 24 when Paul says "O wretched men that I am who will deliver me from this body of death Paul wasn't asking to be beamed out of physical life to go to heaven and finally get the good stuff. Paul wanted out of the corporate body of death represented in the body of Moses, the covenant of Moses. He wanted full transformation into the body of life by Christ. And that's what he goes on to talk about in Romans chapter 8. But throughout the Roman epistle, Paul starts off by saying, what advantage then in chapter 3 verse 1 has the Jew or what is profit of the circumcision? Much in every way. And he immediately goes into a long dissertation of Old Testament passages that say there is none righteous, no, not one. All sin and come short of the glory of God. The only thing that comes out of our mouth is vile filth, blah, 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 on and on showing that the law did one thing. It showed the condemnation man existed in. Now, Ward mentioned Hebrews chapter 7 and chapter 8. In chapter 8, he goes on in verse 6 and 7, and he says, God having found fault with the first covenant promised a second covenant he quotes Jeremiah chapter 31 now wait a minute in Romans 7 Paul says the commandment is holy and just and good how can that which is holy and just and good have fault it depends on how you're seeing it well from what perspective you're looking from God's perspective of what he intended for the law it was holy and just and good why because in Romans 3 19 now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under law that every mouth may be stopped all the world may become guilty before God therefore by the deeds of law no flesh will be justified God did that and folks let me tell you the law still does that we still have the righteous standards of God couched in the law revealed in the law that show us his holiness and our uncleanness left to our own devices 
But he goes on and says, Now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. He goes on to talk about the Gentiles being brought into the same system by faith. The Gentiles, uh, Jews saved in faith, Gentiles by faith. Is there a difference? No, it's the same thing. Then he uses Abraham as an example of that. And in the example of Abraham in chapter 4, we all know the story that at 75, Abraham was called out of the Ur of Chaldees. He's given a promise that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. He goes and he lives and he tries to fulfill the promise of God. That's the point. He tries to fulfill the promises of God. He tries to produce the seed through which all nations of the world would be blessed. Time goes on. doesn't happen. Finally, Sarah says, it's not working, Abraham. My womb is dead. My womb is barren. Take Hagar, my handservant. He does. He produces a son named Ishmael from which all Arabic races descend today. And he says to God, here's your seed. God says, no, it's not. I promised through you and Sarah the seed would come. But God, we've waited and it hasn't happened. That's okay, I promised it. Paul says in Romans 4 as he gives us commentary on this, finally, Abraham got to the point at 100 years of age, Sarah at 90, he said, God, my body's dead in the ability to procreate. Sarah's womb is barren and dead, but you made a promise. I'll not waver in unbelief. We can't do this, but you can. God said, now I have something to work with. And he gives him a child. But in that point, here's what he said in Romans 4.15. Because the law, the realm of human perfection, human achievement, human observance, human talent capability, that's what the law governed. The law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. You see, I used to use this verse in my early in my ministry to beat people with. That's why you need me as a preacher to tell you what's wrong. Because sin is transgression of the law. And that's why the new covenant must be a, a more perfect system of law. Or else nobody would be guilty of sin. Missing the point that this is the essence of the good news. If I am to be restored to what was lost in Eden, what was lost due to the sin that he's dealing with in this context, if I am to be able to stand face to face in fellowship with God in holiness, to be accounted as righteous and sinless and pure, I must be transgressionless. That is the only way. Therefore, I must be in a system evaluated by God other than law. Because where there is law, there is only transgression. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. In chapter 6, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Now let me ask, answer what is obviously the question I always get asked. <laughs> well, you mean to say then that we have no, you know, bestiality. I, we have no laws governing it. No, we do. I don't need Jesus to keep dying to be efficacious for me. I don't need the law to keep being enforced upon humanity to get the lesson. It's like, okay, if you were to take off, stand up at this point, start running into that wall, it would only take me about once to realize that hurts. I don't need to repeat it over and over to know that that lesson still is the same. Anybody that starts here runs headlong into that wall is going to be in pain if not dead. God gave us that lesson in history. Paul said to the church at Rome, the things written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Do we learn the divine standards of God? Do we learn the divine will of God? Do we learn how God views sin, how bad it is? Yes, we do. Will that ever bring us back to God? It won't bring us one step closer than we've ever been. But it will lead us to look for another way that God provides. Now let me ask your question with a question. What happens if Christians think they're under grace and not under law? We'll begin, I believe, to be conformed to the image of God. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of strong family unity in this congregation. And I don't say that lightheartedly. I, I, I really believe it. It's evident here. There are strong families and uh, strong ties that bind. How insulted would the fathers in this audience be if I looked at every one of you and said, you do what you do because the law makes you? Steve, the only reason you're a good father is because the law demands it. And it does. Just take off and stop supporting your family and see if they don't you know, hit you with alimony and child support and all of those different things. The law requires that we provide certain essentials for our family. But how insulting is it when we tell a father, you do what you do because the law requires it. How many fathers do you know, even though the law requires it, 
couldn't give a care about their children. But I tell you what, you take any big strapping man, strong, calloused hands, snarly look on his face, and bring that little woman up next to him that cooks for him and cleans and ministers to him, and she says, Honey, would you do this for me? and see what controls more. You see, I'm convinced that when we see the righteousness of God and we see the standards of His law and we're educated by that and we see that all that the law says, it says to confront us with our guilt and our estrangement from God and our complete emptiness. But we see that in spite of that, God sent His Son to die on our behalf. And through love, He expressed His will through the life of His Son. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and yet you still don't see me? You see, they still saw the Father as up here, unattainable. Give, give us a picture. Give us an image. They were comfortable with Jesus. I have gone into assembly after assembly. And I have asked people to raise their hands. How many here feel more comfortable with the Son than they do with the Father? And almost always people will raise their hands. Because Jesus is someone they're coming. He's a big brother. He's, he's someone that they feel connected with and, and, and they feel that human connection with. Jesus said, I came to show you the Father. I'll tell you what. You put me under law and I'll break it every time. You constrain me by love and I'll move heaven and earth to do what's right. I believe the law still communicates to us God's righteousness. God's view of sin but I believe mostly in light of that relative to me the law communicates to me my complete abject emptiness to do anything by law so I sit there a dead man and I say what do I do well I do the only thing a right thinking dead man can do <laughs> I say only God can fix this only God can do this and so I bring to him Yes, my subset, A to Z things that I want to change. But I bring to him the sin. And I say, God, I don't want to be independent anymore. The only thing that will save me is embracing you and hanging on to you as tenaciously as I can. There is market well. Law is not the most compelling or constraining thing in the universe. It doesn't even come close. The gracious love of God is the most compelling, constraining, delimiting power in the universe and empowering power in the universe. You know, there's nothing legal. We don't have a draft right now, but over a thousand young men have given their life for this country. How do you explain it? Law? How insulting. They know the laws, and because of the love they have for what our system stands for, they're willing to die. Whether that's right, wrong, I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm just trying to get us to wrestle with the emotion. What makes people do that? What makes other armies run in fear from an opposing force, even though they may have superior weaponry and superior numbers and power? They don't love the cause. When the love, the law of God convinced us of the emptiness of man and allowed us to see God's provision and still allows us to see God's provision, love overwhelms us. That's what I believe. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, turn to no. <laughs> Thank you.